I ask you to turn with me to Hebrews 6. We want to move to a different topic. But we start with the topic that we already had. In Hebrews 6, uh, let's see. I want to talk about what it is to go on to maturity. Hebrews 6, 1 says, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. And uh, we have been talking at length about the elementary doctrine of Christ, the things that are in this list that are very useful for us. But uh, again, that all of that has been something of an aside. Uh, the fact is, what the text is really doing is saying, we're going to leave those for now and go on to maturity. So this is an interesting thing as I think about it. Um, you know, the things that are included in the elementary teachings about, um, you know, repentance, faith towards God, baptism, uh, laying on of hands, which is fellowship, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. You know, these, these, many of these things have occupied the place of what people have called solid food, especially teachings about uh, fellowship and uh, what, what to do or how to deal with error, schisms, false teaching in the churches. But actually, if you are following what Hebrews says and the teachings that accord with the items in this list, all of that is elementary. That's elementary stuff. The mature stuff is something more than that, something greater than that. So if we back up for a minute in, uh, into chapter five here, you find uh, we started in this letter with the idea that Christ is the representation of God and that his message comes to us through his servants, the apostles, and that uh, the people of old in you know Israel heard a similar message and came out of a similar world, Egypt, and yet had problems along the way. That's what we're reading. But we begin to make a different point in chapter 5, beginning at verse 5. Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest. He was appointed by the one who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The, these Psalms make no mention of a future Christ or of a, a future time when the Son of God will inhabit flesh. They, they don't mention this Overtly, these psalms, though, demand an answer. They stand uh, on their own. How can it be? How can the Lord say to my Lord, and I'm David the king writing this, you are my son today, I've begotten you, right? Or how can it be, as, as he says here, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek? Well, there's, what order of Melchizedek? We only read about the order of Levi, uh, or Aaron, I guess we should say, the order of Aaron under the Levitical priesthood. These Psalms demand an answer, and that's between the lines. But he said Jesus didn't exalt himself to be high priest. He was appointed by the one who wrote these Psalms. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So all he's getting at here is backing up what he said. We're just backing up the claim that Christ is the fulfillment of these Psalms that demand an answer. But then he breaks out 
And that's how we got to chapter six. About this, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. This is a problem. See, he said, we have a lot to say about this. About what? About Christ being designated a priest after the order of Melchizedek and the reading of the Old Testament in such a way that you see this clearly. But we can't talk about it because you become dull of hearing. Right? And this actually comes up later. <clears throat> Excuse me. In Hebrews 6, verses 11 and 12, we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And this word, that you may not be sluggish, is the same word, sluggish, is the same word that is used in chapter 5 at verse 11 when he speaks of dull of hearing. It's sluggish. So the whole, you know, this whole departure to talk about the elementary principles is a concession that, you know, you shouldn't be like that. You shouldn't need that anymore. You should have matured beyond the point of needing those elementary things. There's more to talk about in God and in Christ in maturity. So he says back in chapter 5, verse 11, that, that again, we have a lot to say here, and it's hard to explain it because you've become dull of hearing. What does he mean? Well, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. Everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. All right, and, and you know, I think that the illustration is clear enough, but so often if you think back to what has been called solid food, what has been considered solid food, and, and it so often has been teaching about fellowship, uh, teaching about error, and, and false teachers and, and how you deal with those things. This is considered solid food, but actually it's not. Those are basic principles. Laying on of hands, repentance from dead works, eternal judgment. Those are basic elementary principles. That's not solid food. That's the stuff that, you know, if we're having to spend time on that, that's a bad sign. That means you're not where you should be in terms of maturity. So that's what he's saying. We shouldn't have to be spending time on that. By this time, you ought to be teachers, but you need someone to teach you. That's not good. You need milk, not solid food. It's the infants that need milk, right? The ones that don't have teeth. <laughs> when did somebody take the teeth out of your gospel? <laughs> You've got to be able to do the work of God. Whoever lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. He is just a baby. Solid food is for those who are mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Knowing the difference between good and evil, you know, making things clear is an indication of maturity. There, there are not questions still about what is right and what is wrong. What should you do or what should you not do? That stuff doesn't stay and it shouldn't stay. There's no reason for it to stay. If there's some question in your mind uh, or in your heart about a thing that is troubling you, well, ask it. You know, go, go to the Bible, go to God in prayer, go to your brothers and sisters in the Lord and see, you know, compare notes. Because you should be in a place as a mature child of God where your powers of discernment have been trained through constant practice to distinguish good from evil. If you think back to the priesthood of old, their job was to distinguish between clean and unclean. You read through Leviticus, 
all the various things about washings and uh, you know skin problems and all kinds of other things where they had particulars about how you tell, is this animal clean to eat or not? Is this lesion something that should be treated this way? Do they have to leave the camp? For how long do they have to leave the camp? You know, all that stuff is laid out for them. And it's not just filler and it shouldn't just be dismissed. Uh, its point is to show us that God cares about the distinctions and that our job as the children of God is to make distinctions in life, to choose between what is clean and what is unclean, but not in a uh, not in the physical sense of the law of Moses, which was a tutor to bring us to Christ, but in the real spiritual sense of what is good and what is evil. We've got to be able to know the difference. We're the priests, the children of God. And therefore, chapter six, let us leave the elementary doctrine and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation. And those are the basic things. This will do if God permits, he continues in verse three of chapter six here in Hebrews. Hebrews six, four, for it's impossible as we continue to think through the rationale. Why are we saying that? We started with, you know, Jesus has fulfilled the Psalms that beg or demand an answer. But we immediately departed to, and this is hard to explain because you all are not where you need to be. That's tough. So why are we on this departure? Well, he said, we, you know, we're going to leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying the foundation again. And if God permits, we'll do that too. And so with time, perhaps, we will revisit these things as is needed. But the third, fourth verse says, it's impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, have shared in the Holy Spirit, have tasted the goodness of the word of God, the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, it's impossible to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Yeah, what are we going to do is what that means. What are we going to do to save somebody who has fallen away when they have already been saved? They've been enlightened. They've tasted the heavenly gift. They've shared in the Holy Spirit. They've tasted the goodness of the word of God, the powers of the age to come, and yet they fall away. Well, what do we have? What do we have now? What else can be offered? Well, it's impossible. They're crucifying once again, the son of God to their own harm, holding him up to contempt. It can't be done. They have to repent in and of themselves. There's nothing that you and I can, can do about this to, to restore them again to repentance uh, as if they had never known the gospel, as if they didn't know right from wrong, and then they learned it and they repented. No, that's not it. These have fallen away and they're fully accountable for that. They had God. They had Jesus on their side mediating for them. They had the word of God. They knew how different it was from human philosophy and human religion. Fully accountable for that. The land, verse 7 continues, that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God, but it bears, if it bears thorns and thistles, it's worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. What does he mean? Well, he means us. If we have been sown by the seed that is the word of God, and we're supposed to produce a crop useful for the one for whose sake it is cultivated. That's God. And if that is so, then the land is blessed. But if instead we bear thorns and thistles, well, it's worthless, near to being cursed. And indeed, he said, its end is to be burned. A Christian who falls away and therefore is bringing forth not fruit to God, but thorns and thistles is worthless and going to be cursed. And the end of that is fire burning. That means hell. A person is condemned when they fall away from the Lord. 
this is a very sad state. And it's for us to understand that this is the meaning when we say distinguishing good from evil. This is the meaning when we say these are the elementary principles. This is the basics of being a faithful child of God. It's not a matter of, uh, you know, well, that's really tricky. And yeah, you know, we can't always tell the difference between, uh, you know, the good teacher and the bad teacher. No, no, sorry. You're going to have to be able to read this Bible and understand it. You have to know whether this is right or not. And you have to know that soon. It doesn't take 30 years. And for those that think it does take 30 years, I'll tell you what you have at the end of 30 years is not much. They still don't know anything because they're walking by the wrong rule. Always learning and never able. Though we speak in this way, verse 9 continues, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. So first of all, we have to understand the seriousness of it. It does matter to have the basics down. You can't go on to maturity until you do understand the basics of fellowship, the basics of repentance. But now, he said, we do think better things, even though we speak in this way, meaning we know what the stakes are, but we do understand that that's not where you're at in this particular case. God is not unjust, verse 10 continues, so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. So God isn't going to forget the good that has been done by the church. If we care about the saints, if we care about the truth, if we stand for truth and provide a respite for the souls of the righteous, well, God isn't going to forget that. He's not unjust. He won't overlook it. This is what Galatians 6 means when he said, whatever a person sows, he shall also reap. That's what it means. If you have sown what is good and what is right, you will reap a harvest of righteousness. There will be a reward in due time if you do not lose uh, your hope, if you do not give up. And we desire, verse 11 continues, that each of you show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So we have an introduction to that idea that there is in the Old Testament, as he says here, be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Well, who are they? It's clear, and that's where we'll get to Hebrews chapter 11 and speak about those who through faith and patience inherited the promises even though they were not made perfect apart from us. Because in, in our generation, if you will, in the last age is Christ revealed. But this is the meaning. We have to be able to read the entire Bible and understand that this is our people, this is our history, and that these things were written for our admonition and these things were written for our building up, that we may be strengthened and that we may overcome. And so he speaks of, of course, the, the seriousness of having the basics right and what's really at stake there. I, you know, I fear that there's too much, you know, of being lulled asleep, you know, <laughs> of people just kind of being comfortable and, you know, all they hear is basic lessons, of some of the most, some of the simplest things, not even about fellowship and false teaching. They're not even getting the whole elementary principles. They're just getting some of it. And, and that's all they ever hear and it's all they ever study and, it, and they barely know it, frankly, because they don't understand the cost and they don't understand what's at stake here. Uh, and so it's, it just doesn't take, it's not important to them. They can't be bothered with the particulars of the situation and the distinctions that have to be made the work that is involved in that, the knowledge that you have to keep before you, the refreshing of that knowledge through reviewing the word. 
They can't be troubled with that because it's just not that important because the, the stakes are just not that high. At least they don't think that they are. They might say so with words, but in point of fact, they don't think that anything's going to happen to them. They're comfortable. They're fine. They go to church every Sunday. You know, it's the Church of Christ. We don't use instruments. Oh, it's good enough, isn't it? No, no, it's not. There's a lot more here in Hebrews 6 among the elementary principles of God in verses 2 and 3 and uh, well, one and two and three. There's a lot more to it than that. And they're not even covering all of those things. But even if they did cover all of those things, they would still be in the place that this text is telling us about. Remember what he said in Hebrews 5.11 about this. We have a lot to say and it's hard to explain because you're dull of hearing. Though by this time you should be teachers. You need someone to teach you again. The basic principles. You need milk, not solid food. Yeah, solid food sticks with me because I think about what people have called solid food, you know, or like I think about gospel meetings in time past of people speaking with the, the you know, the, the preacher about it. Say, oh, that was real solid food. You know, we had a spiritual feast. Uh, you'd hear people declare. And yet, if you think about or if you review what was said, it was about obeying the gospel for the first time coming out of the world. Or it was about perhaps fellowship, how to maintain fellowship with God and not harm your fellowship with God by things that are wrong in this world or people that are doing what is wrong. And that's all good. I don't say any of it is a bad thing, but I'm saying none of that is solid food. That's elementary principles. That's milk. All of that has uh, to do with the things that he says here these are the basic principles of the oracles of God. These are the milk. The elementary doctrine includes repentance from dead works, faith towards God, instruction about baptism, laying on of hands, resurrection from the dead, eternal judgment. And that covers all of those topics. Obeying the gospel for the first time or leaving sin or sinful works, repentance from dead works. Those are elementary Laying on of hands, you know, who do you approve of? What do you approve of? That's fellowship. That's elementary. That's milk. That's not solid food. It's necessary. By all means, it's necessary. All of these things are, and they're good, but that's not solid food. I understand that it's rare, and I get it. I, I can see now how that, in my mind, that was solid. Um, and yet... It's not actually. It falls in the category of the basics in Hebrews. But in my mind, that was solid food because you just don't hear it. You just don't get that. Um, you know, the other congregations in town will not teach about such matters ever. They can't afford to, literally. <laughs> um, they won't teach about that, but it's actually just elementary principle. Forget about, you know, going on to maturity. The minute you start trying to teach about maturity, you find out whether they're in that place, whether they're ready for it or not. It's something that I've come to realize here and over the last few years, I guess. When you try to do what Hebrews is doing and you want to go talk about Melchizedek or you want to go talk about the law of Moses as a symbol the symbolism of the priesthood, the symbolism of the temple, uh, the symbolism of the people leaving Egypt, crossing the Red Sea, you know, all of these kinds of things. You want to go back into the lives of Hebrews 11 and look at Samson and some of the others that it said we've run out of time to cover. Um, you can't do it with those who are immature. They won't let you go there. They oppose it as though it is conjecture, uh, supposition, or subject to interpretation. That it cannot be understood and it is not really bound and is not required. But they start to buck that idea. And unfortunately, that's the sign, the very clear sign, that they are not mature 
they are not ready. They don't have the basics down. They're not ready to move on to the things that are bigger and that make for the maturity of the child of God to set the mind in the right place, to understand the entirety of Scripture. You know, it's not enough to become a child of God. You know, you have to become a man of God, a woman of God, not just a child of God. You've got to mature and become something. When we obey the gospel, we become his children. We participate in the eternal kingdom, right? And the, the Israel of, of old becomes our people. We are children to Abraham. That's true. But after you've obeyed the gospel and done these things, you need to continue to grow. You know, uh, Samuel was given to God and he started in the temple as a boy, but he became a priest. He became a prophet. At some point, he was the teacher. Obviously, when he was a little boy and they took him there, they didn't have him, you know, preaching. He was following the priest around, cleaning things or carrying things or whatever else, you know. When they're very little like that, that's how it is. But eventually, he becomes a leader. He becomes a teacher. And you as a, a Christian should also become a teacher, as it said in chapter 5. By now, by reason of time, at verse 12, you ought to be teachers. You should be able to put these things together, to, to pick up a Bible from any passage and begin to teach Jesus. It's what they did in Acts 2. It's what uh, Stephen did in Acts 7. It's what uh, uh, Philip did in Acts 8 with the Ethiopian eunuch. They opened up Isaiah 53. And from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. Well, why not? Of course, that makes perfect sense. In fact, Isaiah 53 is easy. But that's where we're supposed to be as the children of God when it comes to maturity. That's where we ought to be. All right, let me pause for a moment. All right, so Hebrews 6. We have done down through about verse 12. Let everyone, verse 11, show that same earnestness to have full assurance of hope till the end. We have to have a, an earnestness, a, a genuine desire to know God, to know God better, to learn more, to take hold of this and to be able to use it to teach others and to grow in the faith and to help others to grow in the faith. Um, there's no reason you shouldn't be the person who knows what the Bible says. People spend a lot less time and wear the name doctor. <laughs> uh, I understand that going to school is, is, is a tough thing and getting through med school is a tough thing, but it, you know, we're talking seven to nine years, right? How long have you been a Christian? You know, they get out at seven to nine years and they're able to cut people open, right? <laughs> is that long enough? Well, yeah. You say, yeah, but I don't like those young doctors. I'm always looking for one with gray hair. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Maybe. But if they are considered competent to do the most serious things in life after less than 10 years, why are you not considered a Bible scholar after having been a Christian for a decade or more? Why shouldn't you be a Bible scholar? Shouldn't you know the word of God really well and understand what God has done on the earth from the beginning of time till now, where the Bible fits into this, where the church fits into this, why he accomplished, how he accomplished what he accomplished, why the uh, uh, judges were set, the ones that were revealed were revealed, the ones that were not were not. You should be able to know these things and to teach these things. And if not, why not? Uh, what's it going to take? How much time do you need? Or what kind of instruction do you need? 
We've got to have that earnestness for a full assurance of hope until the end, that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So the promise is uh, here, full assurance of hope and inheriting the promises. Right? The blessing that is on the table before us here in this pressing on to maturity is a full assurance of hope and an inheritance of the promises. If you want to remain in Christ, faithful to him, and have an assurance of your standing with him to the end of life, throughout trials and temptations, you should be in this place of maturity. That perspective on the world overcomes the world. When you understand Ecclesiastes, and you understand what is and what is not guaranteed in life. Well, then you have a sane and rational approach to things that happen, good and bad. Sane and rational according to God, not according to man, necessarily. And this is a necessary thing, and it's a great blessing in the Lord. But understand you have a full assurance of hope until the end. You have the ability to inherit these blessings by means of that maturity. It's that much more strength to make it to the end. If you're always struggling with the elementary principles, then falling back means falling off. There's no room for error. You've got to set those things right, get them right, Set it in your mind and, and move on in the Lord to growth, to the ability to teach others, the ability to help them to understand the scriptures and unlock this both for yourself and for them so that they who hear your teaching may also be blessed. Well, we'll have to come back to Hebrews as we press on to maturity. But there's the introduction. I thank you for your kind attention. If today you are not a child of God, become a child of God, that you may have a blessing, that you may begin on the journey to learn and to grow in him. Yes, faith towards God is important, of course, to trust in him, to believe in him, to believe that he rewards those who seek him. Obviously, his resurrection is of primary importance. You also are being resurrected when you repent of your sins and are buried together with him in baptism for forgiveness of those sins. The old person is dead. The new person is alive in Christ Jesus. You are a Christian. We have water here prepared that you might become a Christian. Today, are you a Christian but have not lived right? Well, repent. Make things right with God again. Go back to the word. Go back to the study. Learn and grow and gain maturity. Do you not know something? Well, why not? Find out. If you don't know, find out. Don't leave doubts in your mind. Don't let them linger and fester and get used to the idea that you can have doubts about the word of God. Don't get used to that. Don't let it linger. If you're wondering, then figure it out. Settle it. The last thing you need is to be used to the idea that there are things you don't know about God or don't know about his word. Ah, Then you'll be fodder for all the false teachers. Don't do that. Learn what God wants you to learn. He put his word together in such a way that you can understand it, didn't he? Didn't he create the mind? Didn't he create the heart? Didn't he inspire the word? Then why can't I understand it? Of course I can. If you're a Christian, have a live right. Repent, make things right. If we can help you with our prayers, we're glad to pray with you for you. Please let your need be known now by coming to the front while together we stand and sing the song selected. <laughs>